Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back after the uh, quick uh, lunch and break. Uh, we're gonna uh, end the um, symposium today. We're gonna switch gears a little bit and move on uh, from all the excellent comprehensive key lectures that we've been watching over the next uh, however, yesterday and today. We're gonna move on to point of care ultrasound, uh, incorporating both transthoracic modality and um, in centers of the gill and focusing not only in the heart, but also other organs that can help in the overall perioperative uh, um, care of these patients. And not only in the operating room by cardiac kinesiologists, but also in critical care units, uh, recovery, even uh, uh, words. So for this session, uh, Dr. Marcus Salvatore is, is going to be the moderator. And myself is the curator. My name is Pablo Present Pair, and I'm a cardiac and physiologist and, and pretty out of echo at Sunnybrook Hospital, uh, where uh, we also run a uh, full point of care ultrasound uh, fellowship program. So I'll leave it up to you, uh, Marcus. So thanks very much, Pablo. So uh, thank you, everyone, for your attention and participation over the past two days. And congratulations to Dr. Vegas for putting together another incredible conference. The amount of work that Annette and her team have put in over the past year cannot be overstated, as evidenced by the quality of the talks and discussion we've seen over the weekend. My name is Dr. Marcus Salvatore, and I'm an anesthesiologist and CVICU attending here at Toronto General Hospital. And it is my honor to moderate the final session of this conference, focusing on the utility and practicality of point of care ultrasound in and out of the operating room. The session was curated by my good friend and mentor, Dr. Pablo Perez Demper, who you just met, a cardiovascular anesthesiologist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center here in Toronto, where he continuously champions and innovates the use of point of care ultrasound in trauma, cardiac arrest, and emergency non cardiac surgery. He has put together an extremely impressive multidisciplinary roster of speakers from across Canada and the United States. And we will hear about POCUS from the perspective of not only the cardiac anesthesiologist, but also the disciplines of internal and emergency medicine. Our first speaker of the afternoon is Dr. Katie Wiskar, a general internist at Vancouver General Hospital. She completed a POCUS fellowship at Western University in London, Ontario, and she now leads UBC's General Internal Medicine POCUS Fellowship Program, one of only two such fellowships in the country. She currently splits her clinical time between attending on the clinical teaching unit and running the VGH Internal Medicine POCUS Service, a clinical team which provides hospital-wide diagnostic and procedural POCUS consultations. Her POCUS passions include VEXIS and POCUS evaluations of volume status, all things echocardiography, and clinical integration of ultrasound findings. As with all prior talks, please post any questions in the Q&A, and we will discuss them all during the panel discussion involving the afternoon speakers. All right, hi everyone. My name is Katie Wiskar, and I'm really thrilled to be here today speaking to you about VEXIS for fluid tolerance. So I have no conflicts to disclose. Uh, my only disclosure as such is that I admit to feeling a little bit starstruck. Uh, VEXIS is something that I'm really passionate about and I spend a lot of my time thinking about and reading about. Uh, but I noticed that two of the faculty member on the conference today who were actually speaking on different topics are actually two of sort of the real godfathers of VEXIS whose work has helped really push this forward, uh, Drs. André Deneau and William Bobia souligny So I will say that I'm very grateful to, to them, to their work and to the work of others that have helped push this topic forward and allowed me to be here speaking to you today. So our objectives today, we'll talk a little bit first about the idea of fluid tolerance and how we look for this with ultrasound. We'll talk about the VEXIS exam, a little bit about how to do it uh, and some of the evidence behind it. And then we'll finish by talking about what the knowledge gaps are. What do we not yet know about, you know, the evidence base, the technique and how to put this into practice. So let's start off by talking about fluid tolerance. So Food responsiveness has been talked about ad nauseum. This is a very familiar topic to everybody. Innumerable publications um, are, are written on the topic. So, you know, will someone's cardiac output increase in response to a fluid bolus? And for a long time, this was kind of a main focus when we thought about fluid therapy and hemodynamics and volume status. Really this focus on the left side, the, the mean arterial pressure, fluid responsiveness. Uh, and this is not unimportant, obviously, but I think recently we've begun to recognize that there is another side of that coin 
just as important as fluid responsiveness, so might the patient benefit from fluid, is this idea of fluid tolerance. So might the patient be harmed by fluid? And, and we all recognize the increasingly the harms of excessive fluid administration and fluid overload in multiple organ systems. So, you know, to name only a few, pulmonary edema, hepatic congestion, congestive nephropathy, congestive encephalopathy, tissue edema, the list goes on. Uh, and I think, you know, for a long time, we, we believed or we hoped that patients were essentially fluid responsive and fluid tolerant to a point, and thereafter became fluid unresponsive and fluid intolerant. And what we realize increasingly is that these are really two separate concepts that can occur at different points in the trajectory uh, in a patient's illness. And those points can actually even move as a patient moves through their illness course. And so increasingly, you know, we really want to think about these separately. And, you know, despite the fact of whether or not a patient's cardiac output may or may not improve with fluid, the kind of flip side to this that we really have to think about is, is there evidence that they may be harmed by additional fluid? So this is the other piece to that kind of volume status question. So how do we look for this with ultrasound? This is an ultrasound conference after all. Uh, so obviously we'll look at the heart. We'll look at the left heart, uh, at LVEF, at diastology, if that's something you're comfortable with, to see if there's signs that you know the left heart may not handle this well. We'll look at the right heart, obviously, for signs of RV dilation, pulmonary hypertension, RV dysfunction, et cetera. To look for left-sided congestion, uh, we can again look at the lungs, we look for pulmonary edema, beelines, pleural effusions. But when it comes to looking for right-sided venous congestion, up until recently, we didn't have a lot of tools. So, you know, we could look at the IVC and the JVP, uh, but, you know, we've long recognized that these are imperfect measures. Uh, they are sensitive, but not specific for deleterious venous congestion. Many patients, especially patients with chronic pathology, will always live at a plethoric IVC. Um, and so, you know, really, we lacked a lot of tools to help us detect this right-sided congestion, this venous congestion. And so this is where the idea of VEXIS comes about. So VEXIS stands for Venous Excess Ultrasound Score. Uh, and again, the principle behind this is, can we take a step back uh, farther away from the right atrium, farther away from the IVC, and look at other intra-abdominal vessels with ultrasound to find further evidence, more specific evidence perhaps, of deleterious venous congestion. Uh, and it turns out, so, so the VEXIS is, is quite a recent concept. This paper, this is a seminal paper on VEXIS that I've shown you a graphic from, is from 2020. But people have actually been looking at these waveforms in isolation for decades in some cases. So this is not a new concept. Uh, but what this group did, Dr. Bobian Souligny and his colleagues, is put these together. So they said, can we look at several of these intra-abdominal vessels? So namely the hepatic vein, the portal vein, and the intrarenal veins, uh, and use them to help us paint a picture of venous congestion. Because we know that each of these vessels has a characteristic Doppler profile with pulse wave Doppler under normal physiologic conditions. And that profile changes predictably with increasing venous congestion. Uh, and so again, what we can do is look for signs of congestion in multiple waveforms because each waveform has sort of its nuances and its pitfalls. But if we see evidence of congestion in several waveforms, that paints a strong picture, really suggestive of organ damaging venous congestion. So I won't go through the details of how to do this in the interest of time, but very briefly, this is sort of what this looks like. So your first point is always the IVC. The IVC is your entry point to congestion. If you don't have a congested IVC, do not, do not pass go, do not collect $200, you know, you stop there. Um, the other thing I'll say about examining the IVC is in the paper, they used a diameter cutoff of two centimeters. Um, and I know because I've spoken to several of the authors about this in person that they actually wish they'd also been able to include some data on the short axis of the IVC, because there's some evidence to support the fact that a really spherical round plethoric IVC is actually a better correlate uh, rather than the diameter or the, or the collapsibility alone. So adding a short axis can help here, uh, help you detect whether or not an IVC is truly plethoric. If you find a plethoric IVC, you're going to go ahead and examine the intra-abdominal vessels where possible. So starting with the hepatic vein, this is usually easy to identify in B mode, uh, either in a sub-xiphoid view or in a transhepatic lateral approach. 
either with a phased array probe or a curvilinear probe. Um, you'll see it in 2D, you'll see it draining into the IVC. You can throw color on to confirm that you have a nice Doppler signal. And then with pulse wave Doppler, you'll put your, your pulse wave on and you'll get a nice spectral waveform tracing. And again, I won't go into too many of the details of this, but the waveform I've shown you here is abnormal. So normally a hepatic vein should have two primary components that are below the baseline indicating blood flow down the hepatic vein towards the heart, an S and a D wave in systole and diastole. And as you get increasing and especially severe congestion, we can actually see reversal of that S wave above the baseline as is demonstrated here. Next, you'll go ahead and find the portal vein. So again, looking in the liver, typically from a transhepatic lateral approach, the portal vein is usually quite easily identified. It has bright hyperechoic walls in 2D. And with color Doppler, you should see that nice red hepatopetal flow. Again, with pulse wave Doppler, you'll get a spectral waveform, which normally should be continuous low grade flow. And here I've shown you an abnormal waveform that we see as quite pulsatile with a lot of variability. Finally, you can look at the kidneys. The kidneys are always the toughest. Uh, the vessels are very small because you're looking for the intrarenal vessels, ideally a vessel that is actually in the renal cortex or at the corticomedullary junction. Uh, so color is really necessary here to help you pick out those vessels. And they, then again, with spectral Doppler, you'll get a waveform. Sometimes you'll actually see the arterial waveform above the baseline and the venous waveform below the baseline. Here we just see a venous waveform, which is abnormal. Again, normal flow is continuous low grade flow. And here we have highly abnormal, what's called monophasic flow present only in diastole. So that's kind of the gist of how you do it. Coming back to the original Vexus paper, very briefly, this is sort of what they looked at. So this was a cardiac surgery, a post cardiac surgery population. And what they did is they took patients on admission to the CBICU did a VEXUS score on them, and then looked to see, did their VEXUS score correlate with subsequent development of acute kidney injury? Now, in the table on the left here, you can see a lot of different gradings that you have VEXUS A, B, C, which is somewhat irrelevant. Essentially, the authors were playing with different permutations uh, that made up the VEXUS grading system. The one that was sort of settled on is this VEXUS 3 grading system, uh, which means severe abnormalities in more than two waveforms. I'll also say here that increasingly, so many of us use in our use this in our practice without actually using sort of a numerical VEXUS score on a daily basis, but rather by examining the waveforms and describing quantitatively or qualitatively what we see, because this allows you to use these waveforms, even if all of them aren't available, which can often be the case uh, and sometimes gives a bit more nuance. But regardless, we can see that here in this paper, what they found is that patients with severe congestion, so a vexus of three severe congestion, had a higher incidence of developing acute kidney injury compared to those who didn't. Uh, what we see here in the leaf plot on the right is actually that a positive vexus score, so again, a vexus considered consistent with severe congestion, as shown in, in graph A, made a much more significant change in the post-test probability of developing AKI compared to an elevated CVP, which is what you see in graph B. So this was a useful correlate for the development of, of adverse kidney outcomes in this population. So that was kind of the, the initial seminal work, again, recognizing that a lot of background work had been done over many years on each of these individual waveforms. Now, I'm not gonna review the evidence in detail because that would be both excruciating and very long, uh, but I'll highlight a few studies here in a couple different populations to try to give you a sense of where we're at right now in terms of the evidence base for this. So obviously a cardiac surgery population has been studied, uh, the work of Dr. Deneau and others. Other than that, the bulk of the literature really is in heart failure populations. This is where we see a lot of this work, especially a lot of the background work looking at these waveforms individually. Uh, this was a really interesting, quite recent study that looked at patients admitted with acute decompensated heart failure. They had a VEXUS score done on admission, and they looked to see which components of this in particular correlated with adverse outcomes. And they were actually looking at death during hospitalization, so a pretty significant outcome. And they found that a very abnormal intrarenal venous flow, IRVF, so a monophasic IRVF is your most abnormal waveform, was quite significantly correlated with 
with death during hospitalization, a pretty impressive area under the curve there. Now, again, this is, this is all correlation, not causation, uh, but some interesting food for thought. The next population here is ACS, so acute coronary syndrome. This is a group where there hasn't been a lot of work yet, but we're starting to see a few papers. So again, they took people coming in with acute coronary syndrome, they had a VEXA score done on admission, and they looked to see whether this correlated with the development of acute kidney injury during their stay. And again, they did find an association here. One thing that's interesting is that in the previous groups, and generally in the heart failure population, we see that it's the people with really severe congestion, a vexus of three, where you see that correlation. Whereas in an ACS population, we actually see the association with anything more than a vexus of one. So that's really any mildly abnormal waveform. Um, and there's a few possible reasons for this. <laughs> My theory is that, you know, in your heart failure population, as we'll talk about a bit later, there's a lot of patients with really chronic pathology who probably never live at a normal VEXA score, right? They probably always have a degree of congestion given their chronic pathology. Uh, whereas in an ACS population, you know, we do see more people come in potentially who are younger with less chronicity uh, and really the development of their AKI is, is gonna be secondary to that very acute change in their myocardial contractility. So this may be why we're seeing some of an association at a lower vexus grade in this population. Finally, the last paper to tell you about uh, is this paper that was done in a general ICU population. So there's been a few studies recently looking at the general critically ill population. This was the AKI VEX study. It's probably the closest thing we have to sort of a randomized interventional trial uh, in this field. So what they did is they took all comers to an ICU. Uh, everybody had a VEXA score at admission. Uh, and then anyone who had a VEXA of more than one had diuretics suggested to them. Uh, and then as an outcome, they separated their groups into those whose VEXA score improved during their admission versus those in whom it did not. And basically what they found is the people who improved their VEXA score from that initial uh, scan had more, had better renal outcomes, so more days free of renal replacement therapy than those who did not. Uh, and this, you know, again, this is correlation, this is not causation. And in some ways, this is perhaps unsurprising by saying, okay, the people who had such severe disease that we couldn't improve their congestion did worse in terms of their renal outcomes. The other thing that's interesting to point out about this population is that there's actually been some other studies uh, that have not shown an association between vexus evidence of congestion and AKI. My theory into that is that, you know, in contrast to maybe heart failure or ACS populations where congestion and hemodynamics are such a big driver of their AKI, in a general ICU population, you have so many other potential factors, right? People may have you know, they may be in hemorrhagic shock, they may have ATM, they may have sepsis-induced microvascular dysfunction, toxin-mediated nephropathy, a whole host of things. So I wonder if that's why in some of the papers that we've seen, we haven't really seen as much of a correlation uh, in those patients. So as a summary to all of that, uh, this table is not really meant to be read. This table, for those who are interested, is from a recent, very comprehensive review that basically looked at all of the evidence behind each of the individual waveforms and the VEXA score, uh, and you can sort of see which populations these were in and what was shown. But to summarize, the evidence still, the bulk of this, you know, dating back, is still for individual waveforms, although we're seeing more and more evidence for kind of this combination. Uh, most of this is still in heart failure populations, although as I've tried to highlight, we are starting to see evidence in different patient populations. And most of this is related to renal outcomes, uh, although we are starting to see things again, things like mortality, things like delirium in one, in one population. So we're seeing other outcomes, but most consistently, it's renal outcomes uh, that have been looked at with this. And then probably lastly, the biggest thing to highlight is as of yet, we still don't have any prospective randomized controlled study of this to guide treatment. So we have no study yet that says if we take people coming in and they get a vexus compared to those who don't, compared to those who just get usual care, they do better. They have better renal outcomes. They have better mortality, better length of stay, what have you. That does not exist yet. All right, so finishing off with what do we still what do we still not know in this in this population in this field. So in terms of technique, 
Again, I haven't gone into too many of the details of techniques. Um, this is an advanced technique. Um, you know, it, it can be taught and we get resonance on our ultrasound rotation. And by the end of a month, most of them can, can reasonably get sort of a portal vein in particular, but it is a tricky technique. A lot of the evidence and things that we, the papers that we've talked about today are performed by a small number of expert scanners doing all of the scanning. So it's kind of yet to be seen how this would perform in a more sort of widespread uh, population with more widespread adoption. Uh, the availability of Doppler ultrasound, especially in handheld, is still varying, although I think that's increasing. Uh, in terms of the evidence, so many populations are still unstudied. As I mentioned, most of this is still in heart failure, although we are starting to branch out. There's also some populations that have been almost systematically excluded from a lot of studies. So especially things like cirrhosis, um, pulmonary hypertension, sometimes valve disease, sometimes um, evidence of increased intra-abdominal pressure. There's a few populations where we really don't have a lot of evidence uh, for this technique yet. And finally, the biggest thing, as I've just pointed out, is that, again, we don't yet have any good interventional data to say that this technique results in a difference compared to the standard of care. Uh, and now this is this is an opinion and this is my opinion and clearly I'm biased because I'm here talking about Vexus. But I don't think this is a reason not to use this because I think it's worth thinking about what the alternative is right. Uh, the alternative for detecting this kind of right sided venous congestion is not great. Uh, we can look at the JVP, we can look at the IVC. We can squeeze the legs for pulmonary edema. Uh, we can look at labs for congestive hepatopathy or congestive nephropathy, uh, but it's not great. We don't have a lot of other great tools to find this. And so I think, you know, as this evidence base grows, we'll, we'll see more that perhaps will lend more comfort to using this. But to me, this is not a reason to not yet adopt this. Okay, and finally, the clinical integration and translation to practice. What are the unknowns here? So as we talked about at the beginning, you know, I think the we are we are increasingly recognizing the importance of venous congestion of this fluid tolerance concept. Uh, I think that that is becoming increasingly accepted, but but that is still growing. Um, as I mentioned, the evidence base is still in evolution. And there will there will always be those who don't want to jump in and adopt a new technique until there is more evidence there is sort of interventional studies i've already i've already said my piece about my bias but i think this can be a reasonable addition at our present state of evidence uh, and then what do you do with this information in practice so there is this very natural <laughs> vexus ferocemide reflex it's been dubbed so this natural tendency to want to diarese everybody who has an abnormal vexus or you know waveform suggestive of congestion uh, and for one you know, diuretics are not always the answer. Uh, so depending on the cause of their venous congestion of their elevated central venous pressures, sometimes things like, you know, treatment of pulmonary hypertension, inhaled uh, vasodilators, treatment of PE, titration of ventilator settings, those other things may be the answer rather than diuretics. So it is always patient specific. Uh, and then the other, the bigger question, I run into this all the time uh, in my daily practice, is how to manage these people with chronic pathology. Uh, so the patients with chronic heart failure, left-sided failure, right-sided failure in pulmonary hypertension, especially uh, valve disease, these patients are really challenging because many of them will not necessarily live at a vexus zero, right? At their, at their dry weight. Their, their chronic disease is such that they always live at a degree of congestion. And so the goal for these patients can't be to diurese them to you know, a normal portal vein. And when we're seeing these patients you know, once or twice, it can be really hard to determine where in their personal sort of disease spectrum they lie. And, and that's always a puzzle. And you know, I think that integrating with the rest of your data and examining these patients serially can help, but those patients are really a challenge still. All right, so what's the bottom line here? Again, clearly I'm biased because I'm here giving you this talk, but I think that this technique can be a really valuable addition uh, and kind of lends more specificity to this search for venous congestion. Because again, we don't have a lot of great tools, uh, even with ultrasound. So this can be a really valuable piece. Um, you know, and I mentioned these waveforms can be challenging. This can be a difficult technique. For me, increasingly in my practice, I, I use the portal vein alone often when the hepatic is difficult to interpret and the renals are hard to get. So even some of this technique 
can be a useful addition to your practice. The evidence base, as I mentioned, is still growing and in, in, in evolution, and I expect we'll see a lot more in the coming years. And then finally, like all things with ultrasound and like all things with medicine, right, this is not the single answer in terms of how to manage patients. Uh, the last thing you want to do is, is to do a VEXA score or, or get a portal vein profile and use that to guide all your decisions to the, to the ignorance of everything else, right? That is not the goal, especially in your complex chronic patients. Really, you have to incorporate this into everything else that's going on, their, their history, their physical exam, their labs, the rest of their hemodynamic data to help you make decisions. All right, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and I think we have some time for questions at the end. Thank you again. All right, thanks very much, Dr. Whisker. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing the Q&A regarding uh, Vexus as people get used to this new idea, new modality of uh, assessing volume status was something that we all struggle with, especially in the ICU population.